Okay. Shabbat Shalom to everyone and uh, wherever you may be in the world. And if you're joining us by uh, video, uh, we have a new starting time for River Shabbat, uh, which is 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time is the anchor wherever you may be in the world. And uh, we use this as an opportunity to, uh, you know, with this new time start, um, that uh, if it works for you on your Shabbat, come and join us live. And you can do that easily just by going to rivershabbat.com and um, just scroll down and hit that subscribe button. And uh, that will get you onto our weekly newsletter. And in the newsletter, uh, uh, when you put in uh, just an email address, first and last name, um, we will send out the live link to that week's River Shabbat live gathering so if you've never joined us before come and join us and uh, we'd love to have you all right we are uh trying to complete the uh series on authority crisis now this is sort of some of the foundational uh teachings uh from over the years and um it's uh one that we've kind of sort of been uh revisiting um, I hadn't actually uh, taught on these things for uh, about four years, and uh, it was time to uh, revisit some matters around this, especially as the Father grows the community and as uh, we continue to be blessed with people more and more engaging with the wider community, um, that uh, revisiting some of these matters uh, are important, um, and, and notably, um, probably one of the most important aspects of uh, this foundational teaching, and I've got here titled The Usurping of Messiah. Um, how does this uh, really uh, work uh, as a community? Um, and the importance of uh, us understanding this as a wider community uh, at large um, means uh, everything. Um, and uh, so we'll go into a, a few things regarding this because it's um, one of the most serious aspects of uh, the teachings uh, in this series. And uh, if we fail to get what we're talking about today uh, as a body, um, I believe that it would be impossible for us to be pleasing in his sight. And so there are very... There are matters here relating to the design of uh, men and women uh, while we're in this fallen time domain, and then uh, what that means for us as a body and ultimately our witness. And if we're usurping the king, uh, and, and for the most part, this is unintentional, but if we are doing this, then it is hard to be pleasing in his sight. And so there'll be some challenging things uh, today uh, in the message. Um, but also some very encouraging things and uh, that encouragement uh, that we may be overcomers uh, as we look at this particular matter, because the body at large um, on either riverbank um, is in trouble here. And so this is a, um, this is a sobering but hopeful message, uh, hopefully for all of us uh, to really consider. I've got a donkey quote here. Um, how we view the ever-shifting authority of man will shape and influence how we view the immovable authority of Elohim. We are living in a very interesting time where all of us have grown up and have been raised in, uh, as we come to the end of the age, and we have all been affected and influenced by a modern narrative. And that modern narrative in particular has been an attack on the woman's design that first came off the heels of an attack on the men's design. And as a result, we've been left very exposed uh, as a people. And what we need to remember as we look at this message today, that his authority is immovable. Regardless of the modern narratives that we have been raised in, regardless of that influence coming into our religious doctrines and dogmas, he does not change. We have actually gone to a place where we perhaps unintentionally have been usurping our Messiah in our very faith journeys. And we don't wish to find that out when it comes to the judgment seat of Messiah. We want to be able to have this discussion now. Well, we still can. Does that make sense to everyone? Why we're actually doing this? Yeah. In the last part of the series, we, you know, this great thing of, you know, what is a woman? And we just 
touched on, you know, um, this shouldn't be hard for us in the community to really understand or to answer this question. We know Rome is struggling with this uh, in so many ways. Um, we don't even know what a woman is anymore. Um, and I want to make this statement. This was defined in the last teaching. I just want to reiterate this. The one who is specially designed to physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually to reproduce life and complete the male design. This is very important that we understand that there is an aspect as we deal with this fallen state and that we're in this time domain that he has done something incredible with the design of his creation. And we now find ourselves in a place where we need each other. So what is a man? The one who is specially designed to physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually reproduce life and complete the female design. That the two may become one, a chad. And this is a great shadow picture, a great mystery, which the Apostle Paul would talk about of how this links to us and Messiah. Everything in the creation is actually teaching us something. And if we don't get it right at this basic shadow picture level, we can find that we will end up usurping the Messiah himself. And we're seeing a massive attack on this by Hasatan and the forces of evil and darkness ascending upon the world right now that is trying to confuse and even eliminate the understanding of this very, very basic and very real design. And for us to understand right back to the garden, what happened and what we were supposed to be as a people. And we are not any longer citizens of Rome. And if we're not, then we need to listen up. And I've got to the ladies. If you want to be treated like a queen, then treat your man like a king. This is the shadow picture of us to Messiah. And this is ultimately the true power of a woman has been stripped away by a modern toxic feminist type narrative that has come in. But on the other side, Men, if you want to be treated like a king, if you cherish your woman like a queen, we have no, we have, uh, we have abdicated and we have lost uh, the uh, ability as men to have a voice. And, and one of the reasons for that is we have abdicated our spiritual headship. And as a result, women in society, we easily see this in Rome, but what a tragic thing it is to see it in the body where we do not see men taking up their spiritual headship and treating uh, the woman the way that she should be and to be cherished as Messiah cherishes us. And so there is a big thing here for us to get. And so we looked at making sure that we as a body can define, uh, you know, what these uh, roles are and what they are. And then we spoke about the great priority, um, you know, to get this straight. Yeah, your Elohim needs to be number one in your life, man and woman, husband and wife. When he is not number one, we get ourselves into trouble. The number two in your life is your spouse. And I know that doesn't go down too well in the Roman narrative. You know, who's, who's the second most important in your life? And you say your spouse. <laughs> and a lot of people would, you know, fall off their chair. But if you truly love your spouse, then you will go do, and you will be in, in, uh, in the creator's ways so that we can be to the source of love, that we can understand what cherishing and, uh, and um, uh, you know, what this whole um, submission to one another, what this all means, what the great apostle Paul tried to reflect in this great mystery, um, which we have just all celebrated, uh, the shadow picture of a literal event that will occur on earth with the fulfillment of Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles. By the way, parents, your children should be third in your life if you love them. Now, unfortunately, that's not the case. Children have become idolatry for the most part. And now the state or the darkness or Rome is stripping that away from parents. They've taken it because there has been something that is put ahead of Elohim. Now the God of this world is sweeping in and even removing children from parents' care. And we're actually seeing this play out on the earth. Um, if you love your children, parents, they will not be ahead of your spouse. You will not be a divided home. And you will not allow the children to divide. True love from parents will never put their children ahead of their spouse. The spouse 
The spousal relationship in the fallen domain is the most intimate form that we can experience in the, in the time domain, not with children. With your spouse is the most intimate place. The children will never know their parents the way the parents know each other. And so if we don't have the order of how we're operating a home and the design in this way, we are going to put the less intimate ahead. And then we'll start to make that idolatry. And we've seen this actually happen. And one of the reasons for that is because Yah, our Elohim, is not number one in our lives. And then, of course, self needs to be last. And we spoke about in the earlier sessions how often this is reversed. Uh, we generally have self first. We have children second. We have this, uh, the spouse third and Yah's last. And we give lip service to these things. But the order is not really real in our lives. And we end up lying to ourselves because we don't have this priority right. And I want to encourage you, marriages, parents, all these sorts of things, get this order right. Self is last. And this is a very difficult challenge in a modern world right now and how this is playing out. And so when we get this order right, though, the fruit of this is astounding. It's like gravity. The creator's order will come into play into your home, your household, and there will be shalom as a result. And the only way we take away this is because we've put self and elevated it into one of those spots where it should not be. And we have this as, as something that we grapple with. You know, Paul would talk about, you know, I, he couldn't stand that, you know, what his flesh was anymore in the end and wanted to get out of here. <laughs> you know, he kind of got this whole picture that this thing was really holding him back and causing a lot of trouble. And if we're to be honest, and we look at our lives as parents and marriages and raising children, uh, our, our, our priority has not been perhaps in the right order. And so we've not seen good fruit in our lives as a result. And then he brings us back to repentance. We turn back to him and his ways, and we revisit these matters, that we can bring shalom and peace back into our homes, into our marriages, and to raise the children in his ways. So, understanding authority. In any situation, who has the authority? This is one thing that is not understood. When you go into someone else's environment, and I'll give you an example. When I go into someone else's environment, in the family, in the community, and I could be visiting a home or whatever it is, regardless of my servant leadership role, especially in a wider community or spiritually, when I step into that household, I am not the authority. And I will respect what the authority is in that home. Much the same way, if you go into a fellowship gathering, water guy, who is the servant leader? You respect that authority. That is the authority that is granted by Yah, not by you. And it is not for us to usurp, but we see this all the time. We don't understand the authority. In other cases, it could be Rome is the authority. You're out there in the world doing whatever it is. And now we're disrespectful to that. And now Rome is in a position where it is now fighting against its own authority positions and it will collapse as a result. Don't think it wonderful that you're seeing a lot of what you're seeing play out politically, let's say, right now in Rome. They do not understand the authorities. They are abusing this and you will not have a society stand on that. And it is eroding and we have experienced the eroding of trust on all these levels. In every pillar of society now in Rome, they are experiencing a distrust in any form of authority. No house can stand on that basis. So we need to understand the situations, the circumstances. This is not about being a respecter of men. But we need to learn to be respectful towards one another and understand the positions of authority that have been given, both in the Roman aspect, but also uh, in, uh, and more importantly, in the house aspect, in his people. All authority, all authority, according to the word, is given by Messiah on earth. Now, we may not understand why certain people get authority, and that's fair enough. We see them abusing it, taking, you know, all these sorts of uh, strange and, uh, you know, and, and in fact, it just appears we're just losing plain common sense these days. But we need to understand that Messiah is in control and is allowing all things on this earth right now. And we don't want to be, get, 
to be caught up in a lot of the bad behavior that we're seeing in Rome uh, and certainly not bring this into the body. So we, we live with this one spit and twice shy. And so we now got to get over this. And this is where we spoke about EAD earlier and things like that. And as a result, we're no longer trusting authority in general. What this does is it hurts us. It hurts us. And, and we bring this now into our faith. And what I want to say to everybody is that for those of us in the faith, we should know better. We have entered into a kingdom. We are not a democracy. We are not a republic. We are not socialism. We are not communism. These are all constructs of a Roman God of this world environment. For those of you that are here and, and gathering uh, in, the, in uh, River Shabbat today, in the wider gathering with, uh, with uh, Olive Branch, and uh, what we're trying to do in discipleship and all of these sorts of things, you have entered into a kingdom. And the king is not the servant leaders. It's not you. Our king is Messiah. He is the head of his people. He is our rabbi. He is our high priest. He is our king. He is our redeemer. And if we truly say we're of the faith, then we will start to understand kingdom thinking. It is, it is not based on how you feel. How I feel. This is an authority structure that is given, that reigns over the creation and the universe, the cosmos itself. And do we really believe, if we claim to have a faith, do we really believe that we have entered a kingdom? So I want to put that uh, just those thoughts into your mind to understand something here. I'm going to read from Matthew 7, 21, 23. I know we're all familiar with this passage, and it actually is sobering, and sometimes uh, it can uh, frighten uh, some of us. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom from heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Not wills, will. There is a will that a king has for all of us. And he wants our hearts to be circumcised and a covenant to be written on our heart that we may love him with all our heart, soul, mind, strength. This is, this is the Shema. This is the reality. His will for us is not different. It is the same for all of us. Now, our journeys will play out different. How we go about this will look different. What we've experienced will be different. Our decisions, our choices, how that interacts with the time domain. But do not mistake this. It's not some mystery what the will of Elohim is for all of us. It's the same. I always hear people say, you know, well, you know, I just want to know what God's will for me is. We'll read it in the Torah. You don't have to make this up. He didn't leave it open to confusion. However, it will play out differently in all of our lives. And the burdens, and the journey, the challenges, the heartbreak, the joy, the servitude. It says, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we did, not, did we not prophesy in your name? Just in case you didn't realize these were actually believers. And in thy name have not cast out devils. And in thy name have done many wonderful works. So there is a people here that are before the king. This is what the king says to them. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. So we're not talking about Roman unbelievers here. We're talking about us. Standing before the king at a great judgment seat of Messiah. Do not confuse this with the great white throne judgment. We are all going to stand before our king and give an account. If that's not sobering to you, I don't know what is. We're worried about the Antichrist? Well, the Antichrist isn't going to judge you. Don't worry about anti-Messiah. Worry about Messiah. We have got our focus in the wrong place here. Depart from me, you that work Torahlessness, lawlessness. The Giannosco here, 
to learn, to know, to come, to feel, to become known, to understand, perceive, have knowledge of. In other words, achad. This is even a Hebrew idiom for sexual intercourse between a man and a woman. You mean the actual shadow picture? The design of a man and a woman is the level of intimacy described here in this statement, I never knew you. In other words, we were not achad. The statement here by Benjamin Franklin, I've got here, but what about a heavenly citizen? Well, this is Rome saying this. It is the first responsibility of every citizen to question authority. So from a Roman perspective, that would be fair. There is a fallen state going on. We have fallen people running a fallen system. And what Benjamin Franklin says is we have to have a way to question that authority because there can be very good and very bad authority in Rome. So there's a fairness to what he's saying. But as a heavenly citizen, does this necessarily translate? I'll read to you in Matthew 7, 7, 8 here. Interesting. Ask, seek, and knock here. It says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Interesting uh, bridegroom speak there. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Now, this is a kingdom statement. The ateo here, to ask, beg, call for, crave, desire, require. Interesting. I want you to hunger for something. Zateo here in the Greek, for seek. To seek in order to find, to find out by thinking. Paul would talk about the renewal of the mind. This this place where we get all of this stuff going on in our head and we have to get this sorted out so that we can get this heart circumcision. Look at this, meditating, reasoning, to inquire, aim, strive, require, demand. Demand something for someone. This is statements of hungering. These are those who desire. But they're not desiring from a Roman narrative. They're desiring from a kingdom perspective. The cruo there in Greek, to knock at the door, simply means this. Notice that the ruling authority here is not in question, but our sovereign actions are. If we're truly in a kingdom, the authority now is no longer in question. He's the authority. And he's saying, now come. Ask, seek, and knock, and these things will be given to you. And I believe that this is what we're trying to do as a community. Many of us, as I always say, are learning to get over ourselves. And so it's a big part of this that we're hungering to know, well, what is this? If I'm no longer a citizen of whatever country I've been born in, you've actually called me into a kingdom. I have to have this renewing of the mind. I need to think differently. The definition of usurping, to seize, take control of a position of power or importance, illegally or by force. This usurping. Now, we can do this unintentionally to Messiah, but it does not mean that we're doing it legally or even not by force in the flesh. What's going on? Are we trying to seize and take control of the throne ahead of time? And if you were somebody that was attempting to do that, are you fit for the bride and Messiah? In other words, to rule and reign with him. Do you think he's looking for people that are wanting to take control of that, especially in a fallen state? So usurping as a people. She was answering and speaking to the Sanhedrin here at the time. Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he's saying, he answered them, and why do you break the commandment of Elohim for the sake of your tradition? Now, they were doing this in many things, okay? But the point he's actually making here is, is something has come into play that is now usurping his ways. Can we do this with our traditions? I use the examples here. I'm just going to read 
uh, from Proverbs 9.1. Very interesting uh, statement here. Wisdom has built her house and she has honed her seven pillars. I believe this is an allusion to what we would call the annual Moedim or appointed times. And every year, and we've just gone through Sukkot, I have a very interesting thing I'm always having to work through with people. I just want to read something interesting further on here in Proverbs 9, 6, 10. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse. And he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. In other words, people that are not in a place of repentance will not deal with any form of reproof and correction. They will push back. They will be goats, but, but, but. That's what a goat does. It butts. Do not reprove a scoffer or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man and he will, cre- he will increase in learning. Look at this. The fear of Yah is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight, or the set-apart one is insight. The word there, simple, the pate, pate, simple, foolish, open-minded. The root word of this, the pata, is to be spacious, open, wide. Wide is the road to destruction. What we're doing is we're allowing, we're opening these things in, and it can get into enticing and deceiving and persuading us we can actually start to create religious traditions on this and actually come up against Messiah himself as a result. Every year it's a code and we've all just come back from this. And and again, I deal with people trying to work through this Leviticus 23 problem, as I call it. And here in Leviticus 23, 1, 2, it's saying, and Yah spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning these are the appointed times of Yah, that you will proclaim holy convocations or set apart gatherings. These are my appointed times. So they are not ours. Every year, and we're also commanded to do these throughout our generations. So if you don't know that you've been coming into the house of Israel, And that Yeshua's own statement is, I've gone out only for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. If you don't understand what Israel is, then none of this makes sense. But most of us here on a journey where you are learning that Israel is a people and that you're being called into a restored house. Now, what's interesting every year, and I deal with this in this, what I call this Leviticus 23 problem, is that in the traditions, many things have been mistaught. One of the big ones is, and if you get the starting gun wrong, it's going to flow right through the teachings, the understanding, and everything. There are eight Moedim. One is weekly, seven are annual. I don't get to change the Torah or to argue with it. This is what Leviticus laid down. Unleavened bread is the first annual Moedim. Now, we know the weekly Sabbath. This is actually the sign of the covenant. We're all here honoring this today. The second of the appointed times, if you will, or the first of the annual Moedim is unleavened bread. The Pesach meal is the starting gun. It is not a Moedim in and of itself. And this is where I have to get people every year to go back. Your starting gun is wrong. And so you're now got your whole thing. You're shifting out of traditions. And many in the Messianic uh, Hebrew roots and uh, our modern Judaism have turned Pesach in and of itself into a separate moed. It's not. It is a part of the moed of unleavened bread. And then we have the second of the annual moedim, which is the first fruits. And then we have Shavuot, or day of Pentecost. All of these were literally fulfilled and set in motion in sequence, literally to the day in that year that they were fulfilled. No time gaps, no nothing. They just literally played out and Messiah fulfilled them all. Why am I laboring this? And we get to the, uh, we continue on with the annual Moedim. And we will get to uh, the fourth of the annual Moedim. And this is Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. Then we get to the fifth, which is Atonement, Yom Kippur. 
And then we get to the sixth of the annual Moedim, which is the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. And then we have the last great day. And this is the seventh of the annual Moedim, and it also represents the eight in total or the eighth of the total Moedim. Now we have the years of creation and they, they go through and, and we have the seven annual Moedims which are all representing a day of a thousand years and a thousand years, but of a day. And the last great day is the final reign of Messiah. So you have the seventh annual Moedim, which is being celebrated on the eighth day, which is the celebration of the completion of eight Moedim before we head into eternity. Now, because this is often confused and because um, this particular thing has come in to Sukkot, we have a very interesting thing that has happened. We've all gone through and we've celebrated this, yet Messiah gives an interesting parable um, that I want you to know, which I believe brings in usurping because we don't understand these basics. We don't actually understand that we are dealing with seven Moedim that are annual and one that is weekly, eight in total. When we celebrate, and there will be a literal wedding celebration that will occur on earth that will be fulfilled literally, it'll be a seven-day celebration. We call this Sukkot. There's an interesting thing that Messiah references here in this parable when he's talking about the wedding feast. I'm going to show you an interesting form of usurping that actually occurred here, which he mentions. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready to those uh, but those invited were not worthy. Who are these who were invited and not worthy? Messiah knows. But I would suggest it would be those who would be familiar with the Torah. Let that sink in. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite them. Some English translation would be the highways and the byways. These were areas, especially, you know, um, uh, outside uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. These were areas that were often known for a lot of monkey business. In other words, they weren't exactly what you would call um, good religious people. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff going on. And yet this is where the king says, I want you to go out to those places. I want you to find those people. I'm going to suggest to you that those might have been us in our lives. There's been a call that has been made, and a lot of you have come into the understanding of the front of the book, righteousness, you know, and we've been uh, brought into understanding that his righteousness is defined in his Torah. And we've had this invite go out to us. Those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. I've got here note. This is in context, going to be the fulfillment of Sukkot in this great parable. It goes on to say this. But when the king, okay, so we're in a kingdom, came in to look at the guests, he saw a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, not I hate you, not I don't love you, not anything like that. But he's addressing something from a position of it's not intimate. It's not knowing. How did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. Not some torturous Dante's hell from Catholicism. Outer darkness. There's something outside this event. If you're not a part of it in the place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, think justified, but few are chosen. Think bride. If the actual fulfillment of Sukkot is in the context here, we are talking about a glorified event. In other words, what I'm going to suggest to you is what you're seeing is somebody tried to enter a glorified event. In other words, the actual fulfillment of Sukkot on earth will only have the glorified attending. There is a sheep and a goat's judgment that is occurring to the nations, and these are not attendants in this great fulfillment. I'm going to suggest to you, if this is a glorified event, you're going to need a glorified state. And you're going to need a garment that had been washed by the blood of Messiah. 
In other words, you had accepted Messiah and you've been a part of that. And those who were not chosen as the bride at the Bema seat will be the guests at this glorified event. In other words, the usurping that was going on here is that somebody was trying to come into a glorified event, which is a garment that was washed clean by the blood of Messiah, was attempting to be a part of something. And the king was removing them. It's a very interesting form of usurping. It says they, they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a statement of mourning uh, in, the, in the way that it's used here. This is very interesting. There will be such a level of mourning for those who had a chance to accept Messiah and did not and experienced the literal day of atonement. And they are going to witness, I believe, those people who will look upon the one whom they have pierced did not accept him. And they will be a part of being outside of a glorified, literal fulfillment of a seven-day wedding feast. Okay, so behavior in the house. The luxury to behave badly is coming to an end. Why am I so sobering or bringing this up uh, right at the front here? Because the consequences of not accepting Messiah first and foremost right now is massive for the world. The consequence of usurping Messiah, if we have accepted the blood, could also be massive as we are, not, we are no longer chosen to be a part uh, of his bridal governance. This luxury to behave badly needs to come to an end. So let's get back to the house. I've got here the parable of ice hockey. And uh, for some of you who know me a bit closer and whatnot, I grew up playing ice hockey and things like that. And I just want to relate it this way. When you go to play ice hockey, and ice hockey is one of those games where you can't physically play it unless you put on protective gear. A uh, puck will, a hard rubber disc, uh, frozen at that, will travel at speeds up to 100 miles an hour. If you're not wearing gear and that hits your shin, it will shatter it. Um, if uh, ice isn't exactly soft and boards and blades and sticks and glass is not exactly friendly. The whole environment is unfriendly. I'm going to call this a fallen state sport. <laughs> it's, it's really not a, a friendly environment. And unless you've played ice hockey, you won't know that you can't physically play the sport at any serious level without actually wearing protective gear. So as Paul would say, put on the armor. So we're in this, we're in this great, you know, this uh, great ice hockey game, you know, in my, in my little parable here. As a part of that, we need rules. Okay. <laughs> now we need a Torah. If you don't have Torah on the ice and here you've got the servant leaders here that are all trying to make sure that a game can actually exist. Okay. What happens when you have too many rules or no rules at all? And so there's a fine balance that needs to be understood by this, both in the players, the coaches, and of course, those who are servant leading to manage this so that we can actually see an ice hockey game. And this is where that old phrase goes, you know, I, I you know, I went to, uh, uh, you know, I went to a fight and an ice hockey game broke up. You know, we, we have this whole allusion to the aggressiveness of the sport. Now, one of the reasons why it's aggressive, because it's a fallen state, it's a foreign environment, uh, you can also skate about 30% faster than you can run. So all your impact levels are way higher than any other form of sport. What that does is it, it brings the human tolerance level to snapping point. And this is why you'll often see violence or aggression in the game. It's not that these aren't that these are bad people and all they want to do is go out and fight and all that kind of stuff. It's just that when you play the sport and you get hit in unnatural speeds, it actually really tests your patience. Okay. And it's not fun being smacked at those kind of things. And so you, you react emotionally and this can intensify emotion. So we have an intensified emotional environment. Now in the game, you get things like tripping. Okay, this is actually a penalty. This is against Torah. You're not allowed to do what this person's doing here. Okay, and this other player is now got the better of them as a result. We have something called hooking, where they'll use the stick and they'll hold that against them. And it's up to the servant leaders to call these things out. Or else we're not going to have a hockey game after a while. 
We've also got slashing. That's really nice. Um, so, you know, if you've ever been slashed by a hockey stick, it's not a lot of fun. Um, this is how you get broken bones and legs and shins and things like this in, in the sport. And you also get things like cross-checking, which is also really nice. So all of these things are a part of uh, that can occur in the sport. Now, they are not the sport, but they can occur in the sport. And this is why you have the servant leaders going, hey, we have to keep this under control. We need some Torah. We need some rules. Because guess what? If you don't have any Torah going on, and this is the, the examples that can happen out there, what do you think will eventually start to happen on the ice without the Torah? You will get this. And then eventually it'll lead to this. Now I'm going to suggest to you that I'm seeing this in the body of Messiah. I'm seeing this all over the place. As we have abdicated the kingdom authority, we're now getting into bench brawls. And we're seeing all sorts of stuff out there as a result of not knowing the authority of a kingdom. And of course, we have Rome witnessing this. So now Rome comes to see our faith. And there's you and me in the penalty box because we're not behaving well. What does Rome think in the end of this kind of behavior? So it comes to looking at the faith. It comes to the faith and it looks at us out on the ice and it says, well, these people are supposed to be playing this game and I'm seeing nothing but fighting and bench brawls. Eventually they're going to stop coming. They're no longer interested in any of our bad witness. What if we were representing our faith this way and it was based on usurping the king? I'm going to suggest to you that Yeshua came to us and he said, I'm going to model discipleship. And I'm going to be somebody, I'm going to put you in environments that can help build you up. Because you've got to learn how to deal with somebody who might be potentially trying to slash you, hook you, cross-check you, all these sorts of things. i got to get you to be able to play this game where you're not going to overcome to your emotionally arrested development. You're not going to just emotionally react to these things. And I can tell you, discipleship makes for better results. It makes for a game that actually people can enjoy watching. We are in a hostile environment. We are told this, but we are to do it his way. And when we do that, we have much better fruit come out of it. So just in my little parable of ice hockey there, was this all a matter of authority in order to play a game on the ice? You better believe it. You don't have a game without it. You have a big mess and a bunch of fighting. I'm going to put these up here. Discipleship and authority. One of the things that I'm seeing in the body right now that is involved with usurping Messiah is people putting themselves into position of leadership. Now, when you do this and you're not truly called by Messiah to do this, you can end up hurting people. When we try and do this too early or we think ourselves something that we're not. And we usurp other authorities so that we can try to assume the position. We are seeing this in the body of Messiah. Undermining true servant leadership is another thing that we are seeing. So those who that are truly called to serve and who are trying to do that and the undermining of that that is going on in the body. And then there's the aspect of uh, servant leadership that has no discipleship themselves. And so they're now trying to do this outside the pattern of Messiah. I have great warnings for all three of these things. We have a number of servant leaders in the body right now who I believe are legitimately called but will not legitimately walk in his ways. They will not walk with any accountability and do not have this in their own life. And I warn time and time again, if you're listening to people and doing that and they do not walk and have the pattern of this in their own life as a servant leader, you're in trouble. It doesn't matter how much knowledge you think they have or they think they have or whatever else it is. It doesn't matter all of these sorts of things. Ultimately, in the end, nobody is to 
serve the kingdom and not serve it from a position of accountability, responsibility, and consequence. Now, if you have a true servant leader who's got themselves in the pattern of Messiah, they're ultimately trying to serve you as best they can. This is what, you know, um, uh, on a wider community aspect, Michael and I would be trying to do. But we're trying to go ahead to actually pave a way in a very hostile game or environment, this fallen state that we're in, this test that, uh, that uh, Solomon would speak about in the great book of Ecclesiastes. But whoever's at the front of the line of anything in a hostile environment, who's in the most danger? The one at the back or the one at the front? Do we really want to put ourselves into a position that we are not meant to be in or not supposed to go into yet? We're not ready for. Because I can tell you that a true servant leader is walking out in front in a hostile environment, and they are the ones in the most danger. And to have people now usurping Messiah who may have legitimately placed them there, and they're usurping that, they are ultimately usurping Messiah. If you're going to go against a true servant leader of the body, you better hope that they are not a true servant leader placed there by Messiah. This would not be good for you. And this is what Paul warned about. Do not do this. And so we've got all this monkey business going on. What does this mean? Respect the one in front of you spiritually. They may have gone where you have not gone yet. It doesn't mean they're perfect. And you'll notice where... If you're the one in front, notice that there's someone behind you. Notice where their nose is. Okay, they, they, they're going to experience all the reality of your fallen state. Nobody can serve Messiah and not be in a fallen state. Now, we can become sanctified. We can do things better. We can grow. We can mature. But the reality of it is, quite simply, we all just stink. Okay? We have to die and go into a glorified state to be a part of a glorified kingdom. So we're in a servitude capacity right now in the kingdom. So respect the one that's in front of you. Be respectful to them. Help the one behind you. This is always the heart of servant leadership. It is never wanting. Just because it may be in front and be in the dangerous zone does not mean that it is lording itself or putting himself or herself above others. We are to share in one another's burdens, thus fulfilling the law of Messiah stated in Galatians 6. These are important aspects of servitude leadership in a kingdom in a fallen state so that we don't end up in such a mess that Rome has no, doesn't want anything to do with us. And now Rome is in their own mess. And can they really look to us now as the example and witness? Are we the light? The usurping that we see inside the camp, you've got basically these sort of three main aspects. And I've got the single uh, women and family in here, or widows and whatnot, that will fall into this. But you've got fellowship, the marriage union, and children. In the fellowship sense, you've got an authority that expresses itself through a fivefold. This is the fullness of Messiah. So whether you're single, you're in small groups, and of course, everybody here is going to be, because we're in the fallen time domain, we're all subject to Rome. Notice I've got Rome on all three here. We're all experiencing the God of this world. We're all in something, but not of it. So we're being impacted by Rome in all three of these levels. But in the house, inside the camp, we have authority levels. And in a marriage, the authority level was given to the male design. Why? We're going to talk about this a little bit. Why is that given? Is it given only to the male design? No. There's actually very important uh, servant leadership positions required for the female design. The authority of parents is a big one. And so children need to understand these, these aspects as long as the parents are administering that authority. In any one of these things, whether it's your fellowship environment, whether it's your marriage, whether you're the children, who is the authority? If this is not understood and you do not know that your Elohim is not running a house of chaos, we can end up looking like a very messy game. So this requires us to take our design seriously and to take our role seriously, or else we're going to end up producing a lot of bad fruit in our lives. And then we're going to look around pointing the finger at everybody else. And we end up with that disease I called themitis. 
And I see a lot of them itis going on right now in the world. Everybody else is to blame. I won't speak too much on this, but this was given to me in the fires of my life under the tree of life aspect. And this is just the way the father had relayed it. And I'd gone through the scriptures and he'd taken me scripture by scripture by scripture, seeing how he had actually designed this uh, sort of tree of life, as I'd call it, this discipleship tree. And at the center of this is the most intimate form of fellowship or relationship that we can have spiritually. And this is with Yeshua at the head and as the king. The next part of that, okay, and as a result of that, and in that is the marriage covenant if you've entered into marriage. So you've entered into something with your king and with your spouse, and you're learning this most intimate form of discipleship that you can actually have. Your next form of discipleship is your closest twos and threes. And this was modeled by Yeshua in the garden, particularly in Gethsemane, where he actually separated some of the disciples he walked closer with. He actually separated them and put them even closer to him in his greatest time of need. And they all ended up falling asleep on him. <laughs> and there's a whole, uh, a whole um, a thing to discuss there. But he's actually demonstrating that, yes, you do walk closer with some more than others. And these are important people in your life. Small group fellowship, this is that gathering where he actually took his Talmudin and he had 12 of them and he modeled this. This is where they could work out questions. They could vomit, if you will, uh, in a safe environment. They could work through matters, test whether these things be so uh, more in a group fellowship environment. And then, of course, there is the wider environments with the local fellowship you know, like we're doing here at River Shabbat or, or Olive Branch or so on, whatever you might be hooked into. And then there is this the wider kahal or the ecclesia of the house of Israel, his wider body and his fellowship. The one on the wider, so when you're coming in and you're doing things like the local fellowship and the wider fellowship, you're in a, le a, the, uh, a less intimate environment. So we can come into these places. We are indeed told to gather and to be a part of these sorts of things like we're doing right now here on River Shabbat. But the thing that was hollowed out of the body on both sides was this real understanding of small group fellowship and walking close fellowship to help us through understanding this hostile environment that we're in. And if a tree has been hollowed out, its ability to get the living water to what produces fruits will die. And so this element has been really under attack. And this is why we are very big in the community based on discipleship principles and never walking alone in doing this. Most importantly, the servant leaders and most importantly, the men to step up as spiritual headship in their own homes and as men, because that, is, that has been drastically put under attack and is now causing the women to go into places that are unhealthy, but they will do. And, and we'll see this recorded in scripture. Adam was put in charge of always seeing the garden as declared by Yah. Okay, so what was the order of authority in the garden? Yah, and then Adam was put in charge to oversee. Adam was given authority by the creator himself. The order that we see in the garden is recorded in Bereshit in Genesis is creator, Adam, and Eve in that order. Is that because Eve uh, was less than Adam, that she's not equal to Adam? No, scripture does not say that. There's an actual design principle being put in place because of a fallen reality that is coming, a fallen state. Why? It says here in Genesis 3.16, to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. This was a part of when something had gone wrong. Okay, and so this was going to be a part now of the physical reminder and the reality of how important these whole designs were going to put into play. Men, as much as Rome is trying to question these things, men cannot produce babies in and of themselves. The woman was given the role to give birth to this and to particularly be a part of some of the most initial nurturing that there was ever going to be in this design. But it says here something interesting. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband. Some uh, scriptures and some bad English translations say your desire will be for your husband. It's interesting if you look at the Hebrew here. Um, the actual Hebrew is intimating here that desiring the longing can be a part of this, but also it can be against in the Hebrew. Now, this is interesting. 
Your husband shall rule over you or will have authority over this fallen situation. So before the fall, even though there was an authority in place, you didn't have the, na- the necessity of the designs to have this put in place. But as soon as this occurred, and as soon as Eve was deceived, partook of something, and then gave to Adam, we have this interesting order that's been put in place according to design. Now, this thing here, I'm going to suggest, is subject to something. Because it can be positive or it can be something that steps up if something's not in place. And I'm going to suggest that if a woman is experiencing an environment where her husband is not taking up his design role, then she will step into that place. And in fact, this is a promise of Genesis. This is not some negative thing. If a husband does not take up his spiritual role and there's especially children involved, somebody has got to do this but it's not in the order and it's less than ideal. But what Yah has built into the design is that this will occur. If the husband doesn't do it, if he doesn't do what he's supposed to, this will happen. And so a lot of the usurping that I, that I see in witness in the body by, by wives to their husbands is often the result of the husband has not stepped up spiritually. And so she is fulfilling prophetically what we are seeing here in uh, in better sheet and in genesis if she cares and if she is hungry and thirsting and has a love for the truth so was this a quality or design when paul spoke you know i call this elephant in the room in first timothy second 2 11 14 we see this let the woman learn in silence with all subjection and this is where the modern day woman goes oh and this is these scriptures are used to you know um you know somehow make a, a woman less equal or whatnot in the relationship it's not what it's saying paul has an intimate understanding of what occurred in the garden and he's saying we've got a design problem here and he's saying because of this when it comes to the shabbat gatherings and things like that i am not going to have women be teaching in that particular environment nor do i um tolerate the usurping of authority over the man. Now, this is interesting. Why? Is he just coming up with this in his imagination, or does he understand what actually took place in Bereshit, in Genesis? This is very, very important that we don't make this about some modern narrative, that we understand it as a true design aspect. Because if we don't understand the design aspect, women could become and be put into a very unsafe environment. And I'm going to suggest to you that something is unfolding on the earth right now that is horrifying. And women have never been in an unsafer position than they are now on this earth. And it is terrible what we're actually seeing. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. So he's making the point. This was the order. This was the authority given by Yah. Not by me, not by you, not by anybody. This is a design matter. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Now, this is interesting. The word they used to usurp, the authentio, um, one who with his own hands kills another or himself. So taking this position, okay, remember this definition of usurping, to take by force or perhaps illegally, in other words, not according to Torah. One acts on his own authority, autocratic, they become absolute master to govern or exercise dominion over another. Now, this is very serious if this takes place. In a marriage, and it is very serious if it takes place in the body of Messiah. And the reason for this is that it will allow for deception, massive deception to come in, spiritual deception, because there are certain design elements at play here, and we need the nurture protector and we need the overseeing protector to work together as equals to come together as a chad. But we are to do it in the order that the Creator laid down. We have a modern toxic feminist narrative that most of you have grown up with, which has sought to try and destroy this because they've tried to make it an equality argument and not a design argument. It is very important that we do not get caught up in this right now. None of this is about equality, but nobody in society now is allowed to have the design conversation. In fact, if you even attempt to now, you're going to get in and have all these accusations made against you regarding all this gender-based confusion. And it's very scary to watch it play out. In Proverbs 31, 10, 12, it says this. It's an incredible great shadow picture. An excellent wife, and who can find? She is far more than precious jewels. 
Now, I'm going to suggest to you, this is interesting. The wife, the nurture protector in all of this is actually the shadow picture of us to Messiah. And I, I've heard in many, many a time over my servitude of a woman saying, you know, I love God. I do this. I do that. I serve the creator. And I watch how they treat their husband. And I'm going, I'm sorry. I see a disconnect. Ah, I've got all the reasons in the world to treat him like that. Well, you might. You might not. But I can tell you one thing. If we think we can usurp in the shadow picture of this and then go before a king and fool him, we're not fooling anyone, and it'll be the bema seat that we find out we didn't. Depart from me, I never knew you. Think of this as Messiah and all of us now. Men, we're all this picture in this. The heart of her husband, the heart of the king trusts in her. And you have no lack of gain. This is to all of us as a body. He's looking for something that he's going to govern with in this last final age in the human time domain. And then we go into eternity. Look at this. She does him good. Are we doing Messiah good? Or have we done, gotten out of order, this great shadow picture in the garden? Have we got this out of order spiritually? And are we all now becoming guilty of something? Are we assuming the throne? That's all of us. And not to harm her all the days of her life. I believe we have a king that wants to bless us in the design. Hugely. And a lot of the things we are experiencing, this bad fruit in our lives, is because we are not taking seriously a design, a shadow picture, which is teaching us what, what he is to us and what we are to be to him. This is the true power of a woman. And this is being robbed in the shadow picture right now on earth. I tell you this, ladies, when a man has a wife that is truly in the nurture design, and does not think herself less or more, that is truly taking the design of the creator, he will die for her. She is in the safest hands possible. And I'm going to suggest to you now that we are in a world that if we look like this spiritually to him, we are not safe. Women are now in the most unsafe scenario and situation I have ever seen. Because men are no longer interested in being men and to truly protect their women spiritually. And now it's playing out physically. And now physically, I have never seen an environment where women are more unsafe than they are now. And they better hope nanny state really keeps working here. Because if the cops aren't showing up, no one else is showing up for you, ladies. And these guys wearing dresses aren't going to be there for you. This is not a joke. And I'm suggesting to you that this may be all a great shadow picture of us spiritually. Which is the weightier matter. If we're usurping the throne and the authority of the throne, and we can't even understand this in the basics of the shadow picture of the creation, how do we think we're, this is going to play out spiritually? And I'd say you're seeing all of this in the world in Rome. And I'd say there's a spiritual picture unfolding in the body. Rome is fighting back and they are trying. I got some examples here up on the screen. They are recognizing that this is in trouble. And these are actually political leaders in the Roman front, women, good women who are standing up and saying no more. There's not the men to do it. And there's not a society that will listen to those men. So the women are standing up. They are doing what we would see promised to us back in Genesis. We're actually still seeing whether Rome knows it or not, it's playing out. If the men aren't going to do it, we are. And so Rome is still under the authority of the king, whether it understands it or not. And I'm going to suggest that what we read right now in the house of Israel more than ever is we need women of courage and character in the faith to stand up and be a witness at this time. If Rome can do this at the very basics, what are we doing, ladies, in the house? 
Are we actually a wife that is pleasing in Yah's eyes? Are we a woman that's pleasing in Yah's eyes? Are we tolerating people that are demeaning your very safety? Whether it be family, friends, whatever it is. I've had some very serious discussions with women in the body lately. Men have lost their voice now in this whole scenario. If we don't have the women stand up and hold other women to account, if you think certain behavior against men is okay, right now, you're, you're becoming and you're a part of making this an unsafe environment. Any woman in the body that has friends and family that would support the modern narrative that's going on in Rome that is against men right now, it is the women of the body that should stand up and need to stand up right now and say, no more. You are making me unsafe. Do not tolerate this. Be the witness, but be the witness for the house and the king. Be what it is supposed to be, because without good women right now in the body, there is nothing holding back. Utter collapse. Like I say, Rome is trying now. And, we, and, and in the Roman political world, I've got examples up here on the screen of, you know, good women in Rome who are trying their best to do it. And I'm suggesting to you, we now need the good women of the house of Israel to stand up and hold other women to account for their behavior. It's not acceptable. This physical example of a matter of authority, I've got King David here. At this point, if you read the chapters uh, preceding all of this one, uh, you'll understand that Saul had some issues because he actually feared David. He actually tried to have a go at him with a spear a few times. And, you know, I don't know why that wouldn't have been a hint to David the first time just to never come back. But nonetheless, there's some very interesting behavior being here displayed by, um, by what we're seeing with King uh, Saul. I'm going to read here. And he came to the sheepfolds, by the way. Okay. And this is after all of these things. And eventually, you know, Saul's going to come up against King David's men and he's going to take him out. And where there was a cave. And Saul went to relieve himself. I'll leave that to your imagination, but he's obviously um, going to be in a vulnerable state. Now, David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, here is the day in which Yah has said to you, David, behold, I will give your enemy into your hand and you shall do to him as, as it shall seem good to you. So his men are encouraging David, take it. Take the authority. Then David arose and stealthily cut off the corner of Saul's robe. Now, this is really interesting and often missed. By the way, if he cut off the corner of his robe, what do you think that was? I can tell you right now, in this whole example that we're seeing, he cut the king's tzitzi off, the corner of his robe. He was that close, and Saul was that vulnerable, and he was that stealthy, but he took his tzitzi. Afterward, David's heart struck him. Now, this is interesting. If the seat seat is, the, is, is supposed to represent this covenant that we have with Yah, this is interesting. David would know this. And he's actually taking this off the king. Because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He's not having a, a conscience of heart here because he's just holding a little piece of unknowing fabric in his hands. There is something going on here. That is missed. So he's taking this great symbol off the king. And he said to his men, Yah forbid that I should do this thing to my master. Yah's anointed to put out my hand against him, seeing he is Yah's anointed. What David is recognizing in this moment is that whether I like how this authority is treating me or not, whether I agree with how this authority is treating me or not, Yah has allowed him to be there. And David has got a chance to take it all in his own hand now while, while King Saul is in a very vulnerable position. And the thing that is reminding David, don't do this. So David persuaded his men, look at this, his men are so willing to do this. David is now standing up with his own men saying, whoa, 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 whoa. 
He said to his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. Look at this. Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and he called after Saul, my master, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. This is a man who's trying to kill him. But it's also his king. And it's also the authority allowed by Yah. And David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of men? The Lashan Hara of men around you that are telling you what you want to hear and how bad I am. Behold, David seeks you harm. Why are you listening to these people? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how you gave to you today in my hand in this cave. I believe he's holding the seat seat in his hand. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my master, for he is Yah's anointed. Now, if this is an example of behavior in the body, of bad authority, yet still appointed by Yah, if this is the behavior that the seed line of Messiah is going to come from, I'm going to suggest to you that you are seen an overcoming, uh, an overcomer at a level that is bridal governance, at a level that is so serious to have somebody wanting to seek your life. And you're still going to submit to Yah's authority is a much greater example than most of us have ever faced. See, my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand. He's holding it. Wow. For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know he's giving it back and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May I judge between me and you. Now, this is where David puts it right back to kingdom authority. May Yah judge between me and you, not me and my men and my emotions or your actions, even to wanting to kill me. May Yah avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. David would not take the authority on his own merit. And if, and if you know Saul's behavior leading up to this, if anyone in the flesh had an excuse to do so, especially he himself being anointed by Samuel, he had the spiritual and the physical reasons to do it all. And yet he left it to Yah, the king. He put this all back into Messiah's hands. He did not usurp. The spiritual example of this in Jude 1, 5 to 6. Now, I want to remind you, in this little book, Jude, it is incredible what's recorded here in this little book. Also, the fact that he's aware of this account is also an interesting thing. Suggests to me that he had a conversation with somebody who may have been resurrected uh, along with Messiah. And that would have been Moshe. But this is interesting. Although you once fully knew it, that Elohim, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, so he brought the Hebrews out of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority. You mean there's a kingdom at play here that has a servitude messenger host? Yes. And this is the first thing pointed out here in Jude. But left their proper dwelling, he is kept in eternal change under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So the great white throne judgment. So something's going on here. The position of authority is concerning the messenger realm, the angelic realm. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual morality, pursued unnatural desires, served as an example by undergoing the punishment of eternal fire, Yet in like manner, these people also do, relying on their own dreams, defile the flesh and reject authority and blaspheme the glorious ones. Now, this is interesting. There is going to be a people that are going to reject authority, and they're going to go relying on their dreams. They're going to be defiling their flesh and rejecting authority as a, as a result. This is where it gets really interesting. But when the archangel Michael contending with Hasatan, was disputing about the body of Moshe. 
So Jude here has an awareness of an event that went down that's interdimensional in nature. It says this, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, Ya rebuke you. Now, this is interesting. We have Hasatan, who was once the order in this highest level in the angelic host, now facing the one who replaced him, basically. So we have got a tank against a tank here, if you will. And we got the body of Moshe as the example being recorded in Jude. We got a very serious thing. If there was anybody who had the power and the ability to deal with Hasatan regarding this dispute over the body of, of Moshe, it would have been Michael. But I believe Hasatan's trying to deceive him like he's eventually going to do with the third of the angelic host. But Michael doesn't fall for this. This is interesting. But these people blaspheme all that they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand extinct, instinctively. So they just come against authority. Woe to them, for they have walked in the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain. Balaam's error. Again, a major usurping of authority. And the instructions given to Balak of how to deal with this house of Israel that he so much feared and perished in Korah's rebellion. Again, those who came up against the authority of Moshe. All the examples being used here are usurping, ultimately, of Messiah. Do you know, there's something interesting recorded in Proverbs. And as we bring this to an end, I want to make this very, very clear. There is something that is given in Proverbs that was distinctly known. There are six things that Yah hates. The seventh is an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord amongst brothers. This one's the abomination. I'm going to suggest to you what you're seeing in these things have a very interesting link to the last six, seven parts of the actual covenant itself. Body eyes. This is pride in its simplest form of arrogance. Yah hates pride. The Hebrew word there, the year is translated in the construct, a high wall, exalted, be exalted above and also mean to raise the soul of someone, depending on its context. A prideful and arrogant person glorifies himself above another person, looks down on others, and actually thinks they are better. Lying tongue, speaking falsehoods of the tongue, often for personal gain or interest. Remember, he hates these things. This is how you want to know how we usurp Messiah. We're going to be involved with these things ourselves. Hands that shed innocent blood, intention and killing of an innocent person for self-gain. Heart that devised wicked plans refers to the core of his or her personality, including the will, emotions, desires, and so on. We mentioned emotionally arrested development earlier in this series and how it can impact us and actually get us to engage in things that Yah hates. Everything we do is a product of what is happening in our head. And if we don't experience a renewing of the mind, it'll play out in our actions. Telling someone to follow their heart is often folly for advice, since the heart is desperately wicked and a deceptive thing. And this recorded in Jeremiah 17, 9. We require heart circumcision in order to deal with all of these ways that we can usurp him, which he hates. Make haste to run to evil. In other words, move swiftly and easily not to do good, but partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil on the evil side. And we'll do this automatically and quickly in our emotional reactions, and we will choose evil. And we are ruled by our emotions through our behavior. A false witness that breathes out lies, a false witness with the intent to harm or obtain self-gain by a lying tongue. Not even truth. This is a slight distinction from Lashon Hara, which can often be truth that's being used for self-gain ways. And then the last one, who sows discourse among the brothers, intentionally generating a rift between individuals to produce a climate of distrust 
even suspicion in the hearts and minds of others around them. This action is often driven by a need for self-adoration. In other words, I'm going to tear someone down in order to make me look good or build myself up. We don't always need to completely be open with all matters on all things to just anyone. This is not wise behavior, and it is unsafe, and it is hurting each other. There are certain ways that we deal with things, and this is one of the greatest things that is um, the antidote to is when Messiah said, go to make disciples of one another so that we would go and work through matters in a safe, accountable way. Now, Matthew 25, 40, just is an interesting thing here. The context here is a sheep and goat judgment happening during the literal fulfillment of atonement. And that's what he says to them. I believe that his bridal governance is with them at this point. And he's saying something to those who did these things for her. And all of these things were giving them, you know, something to eat, to drink, to treated them in a certain way. But they were unaware that they had done this. In any case, he makes an interesting statement here. And the king will answer them. Truly, I say to you, these are going to be those judged as the sheep favorably in the sheep and goats nation's judgments. As you did to one of the least of these, my brothers. So he's pointing to something that's with him. You did it to me. Now, if this is going to come down as a part of a nation's judgment, as a part of the great fulfillment of the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur or Yom Kippurim, if this is a part of a point that he's making, I suggest we all take this very seriously. What we do to each other, to our spouses, to our brothers, to our sisters, to our servant leaders, what we do to each other, we are doing to him. And if you will usurp them, and think nothing of it. We're heading for a Bema seat, a judgment seat of Messiah, where we could face the consequences of what we did to each other, we actually were doing to him, to Messiah in us. David summed it up in such incredible ways. This man not only was an overcomer and passed these great tests and recorded here in the Psalms, he writes something that's truly unbelievable in his state of repentance. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin or missing the mark. For I know my transgressions and my sin. So my intentional actions against you and my missing a mark is ever before me. He knows this is coming, a judgment. And he's a king of Israel, writing this. Look at this. He gets it. Against you and you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. David's resume wasn't particularly great over the course of his life and many of his actions, but he'd gotten to such a state of repentance that he realized he was doing it to Messiah. It wasn't just that he sent the woman that he desired to husband to the front lines to die. He realized he'd sent Messiah to the front line. And this is the moment that it's being recorded in the Psalms. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment, which he knows is going to be righteous. My goodness, the king of Israel. I did it to you. I thought I was doing it to them for my own self gain. I thought I treated my brother or my sister the way I thought I pre treated my wife or my husband this way or my children or another in the body or a servant leader, whatever it was. But ultimately, true repentance is going to bring us to a point of overcoming, which David demonstrated even to the sake of his own physical life. And now he records the whole revelation of it all. I was doing it to you the whole time. Are we the usurpers? And this is an important question to ask all of ourselves from wherever we're asked to serve in the body, to how we walk together, to how we treat one another, how we do, deal with our marriages, how we deal with our children, how we deal with uh, matters in the body. What is our witness? And is our witness 
that we're usurpers? Or is our witness that we actually understand there's an authority and that we've entered into a kingdom? Revelation 21, 7, the revelation of Messiah puts it all together in the end like this. The one who conquers, and some of your trans English translations will say overcomers, the Nikael, the root word, the Niki. To overcome, conquer, to come off victorious, to hold fast their faith, temptations and persecutions. Look at this. Look at the, look at the language. One who is arraigned or goes to the Torah, the law, to win the case, to maintain one's cause. The one who overcomes will have this heritage. And I will be his Elohim and he will be my son. True kingdom authority comes with overcoming. Not with our knowledge or supposed knowledge. And that overcoming is directly related, I believe, to our usurping of the king himself. Because we're doing it to each other. May it not be found in this community. May we become a different witness now at this time. As the world is dying and the darkness is descending, will we become the light? Will we learn to behave and be a witness that is pleasing to the king? Or will we keep hanging on to all our false narratives, our worldly upbringings, everything we've been taught, our pride, our hurt, our emotionally arrested development, all of these things? And do they all affect authorities? And is the true authority crisis, as I'm going to suggest, the true authority crisis right now on earth may actually be his own people that are usurping the kingdom because we're the ones that know that we have a king, not this world in Rome dying all around us. It's us that should know better. Okay. So let's leave it there. We've made it through authority crisis. Um, we're going to come back for a q and I think I noticed uh, Michael was on there today. So I might, uh, we're going to try and get him in here for the, uh, for the Q&A as well. Um, so take a quick break and uh, go do what you need to do. And uh, we'll be back here shortly uh, to have a Q&A on this teaching and the rest of the series. <laughs>